Um, I welcome all of the uh, panelists for today. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about, uh, you know, what it is about SSAI that that makes it uh, such a, a, a good technical solution for delivering ads uh, to CTV, what the some of those uh, uh, pain points are today uh, in that technology, um, and uh, uh, how, how you can deliver the best possible uh, experience for uh, your viewers at the end of the day. Um, but first, I want to introduce the panel here. So uh, you already met uh, Ben Antier, uh, co-founder and CEO of Publica. From Index Exchange, we have uh, Rob Hazan, uh, a senior director of product there. Uh, we've got Eric Opica, uh, president and CSO at Synodyne Networks. Diana Romero, uh, uh, who's the manager of digital standards and partnerships at uh, Publicist Media Exchange. And then myself, I'm uh, product management at uh, Tech Lab. Uh, working on uh, video and ad experiences. Okay, I think I can stop sharing this. We can jump in. Uh, uh, all the panelists, uh, feel free to turn on your video and unmute now. So uh, I think we can kind of kick things off. I just wanted to open this up to to everyone on the floor uh, and just wanted to get your take on on what it is about SSAI technology that makes it uh, so desirable in, in the prep, the preferred mechanism for uh, delivering uh, uh, video ads uh, in CTP environments. Well, I could start here. I would say, you know, you know, uh, looking at it from a customer experience standpoint, I think it uh, it uh, emulates and has the reliability uh, that uh, consumers are used to experiencing with uh, traditional uh, linear and broadcast television. I think, um, um, you know, in earlier iterations of, of the ad support environment, um, especially ones where, you know, the tactics like player switching and other things were, were deployed, um, you know, typically, uh, you know, the, the advertising piece was the, probably the single biggest failure point, uh, for the consumer experience. Um, uh, and, uh, most of that was, you know, all the client side pieces, just dealing with the wide variety of different client issues, um, were, was a huge challenge. You know, I'd say in the early days of, of a AVOD, uh, really kind of predating the fast model from, you know, uh, the early, you know, 20, uh, early 20 teens to, to present, that was sort of the ever present issue that most teams were constantly dealing with. So I think um, it take, it reduces operational burdens for teams that manage, um, uh, manage ad supported experiences and provides a really great experience. Um, and then of course, on top of that now, uh, which with a lot of the, the new technologies that, that, uh, uh, sort of work alongside SSAI uh, provides, uh, you know, more robust data uh, targeting and other things that weren't available as well. It cer certainly seems nice for publishers that they can just have a, a simple player, doesn't have to deal with the intricacies of, of ad insertion, right? And, and, and it means that they can have effectively a dumb player that just consumes a video stream and, and the SSAI can handle a lot of the complexity of how do you actually encode it correctly and make sure it's the right volume and, and, and all that stuff. So it, it feels like it makes life a lot easier for publishers, which, which is nice. Are there any uh, uh, limitations to server-side ad insertion compared to other uh, uh, alternatives for delivering ads? Or are we basically at, at parity, would you say, uh, with, with client-side ad insertion, just in terms of all the functional aspects that you can get uh, from targeting, measurement, uh, things of that nature. Yeah, I think the limitation is that it's difficult to run client-side code in parallel, right? Because everything is happening server-side and the player, like Rob just said, is expecting one, one feed, right? One stream. Um, but to me, the limitation is not on the SSAI side, it's on the measurement and everything else side where we shouldn't rely on JavaScript to, to do all these things, right? And what, one of the analogies I, I make is, you know, when you set up a wire transfer, you don't have to have a JavaScript snippet running on the other side of the, your, your transfer to make sure that, you know, the transfer was received and that the amount was correct, right? So I think it's just the, the, the limitation is more that our industry has relied on a different way of measuring and authenticating things. And that just means that we have to update our standards and, and the way we do things to make sure that, we can provide the same level of measurement and security in a server-to-server -server context. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I think um, I'm with you that I don't see it so much as a limitation as like it's an evolution, right? Um, and and uh, it's it's sort of catching up to the way things are done in, in other industries, right? So you look at, you know, fintech, for example, is an example that you give. I think it's a, an analogy that we use pretty frequently, right? When you look at the transactions that happen, you log into your, to your online banking portal, et cetera. Um, you know, you have, you have a secure experience and, and, and it's all, you know, all the transactions are done server to server. And um, that's not a limitation. That's the way that that industry works. And I think the way that our industry is also heading. Awesome. All right. So, so where are sort of some of the, the biggest uh, pain points? And I'd like to ask actually, uh, Diana, from, from the buy side perspective, uh, is there anything about SSAI tech that you wish worked a little bit more smoothly, uh, more streamlined? Are there are areas of, of uh, running a campaign uh, using uh, server side ad insertion that interrupt your workflow? Or is it basically something that you don't think about? Um, as I said, definitely, um, I think a pain, pain point is definitely the, the talk about fraud. Um, we do see a lot of uh, those kind of like fraud conversations and fraud attacks uh, gaining a lot of press releases, um, a lot of traction in the media. Our clients really pay attention to that. So we definitely like to, to continue to work with the industry to bring that transparency and that confidence uh, to our clients that they're actually the system and worse and obviously um, we needed to, to update those tech specs as well to make sure that uh, we're actually providing that confidence and that's something that um, from a publicist perspective we're really trying to, to, to ensure and to collaborate and to make sure that actually throughout the supply chain um, all the different sort of data points are actually working together to, to address that, that as well. I think um, when we look at, at, at fraud, historically, um, we uh, partner with verification vendors to really understand where, where is that happening. And, and there has been a lot of um, um, improvements in terms of reviewing that, but I think um, the new specs definitely will help uh, bring that confidence to, to the clients for sure. Awesome. Yeah, I, and I think I definitely want to uh, touch more on fraud and transparency uh, in just a bit here. Um, I think I, I forgot to mention at the top too, just to, to the audience that uh, we're going to save some time at the end for Q&A. So if you have questions, please uh, start to throughout the, the rest of the panel to enter those uh, into uh, the submit the questions and then I'll review those towards the end and, and we'll start uh, answering those. Um, yeah, that was just sort of an aside. So uh, back into the let, let's talk about programmatic in general then about uh, SSAI and we'll get towards uh, 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 trust and transparency in ad fraud. So I've heard that uh, in general, around 80% of uh, programmatic and CTV is, is transacted through PMPs. And I'm curious if, if that's, you know, you know do, do you think that's the way that the market is going to, to remain? Or do you think that it'll be a little bit more open marketplace down the line? Uh, if so, what needs to happen to, to ease that transition for, for buyers to achieve their goals and to sort of uh, scale up to, to more open marketplace uh, type transactions? This is for well, I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy to, to jump in on this one. Um, so I, I do think it's going to evolve towards more open marketplace. I think that the challenge today is exactly what Diana said: is a lack of trust and transparency, right? So that's why you why do you rely on deals? Really, it's because the other signals that you're getting in your bid requests are not trustworthy. And so you say, well, I'd rather set up a deal directly with the publisher that I trust. I'll trust them to send me this deal ID on the right type of inventory and at least I'll protect myself that way, right? So it, it makes sense. And, it, and I think, you know, in, in any marketplace, that's how transactions would start is by, by, you know, doing a little bit of extra effort to gain that level of comfort. Um, however, you know, programmatic wasn't built to uh, recreate the same, you know, direct approach of a seller has to shake the hand of a buyer and then we, we, we start, you know, working together. So it's, it's in, inevitably going to go towards more automation and, and more um, open bidding, really. Um, so I think to, in order to do that, it's first of all, making sure that the signals are present. Right. I, I, you know, one of the things is only a third of bid requests contain content signals. So you, so you got to get those signals in, in the bid request Two, that the buyer can trust the signals. So we can we can talk about how, how that can can be done. Um, 
And then three, that there's true open competition so that any buyer can bid at any price and get a real chance at, at accessing that inventory. Because the other reason for, for deal IDs, if in a waterfall world, you, you have to fight for position, right? Oh, I need to be in position one. Otherwise, I don't get access to as much inventory. And so I think it's going to make the, the marketplace much more dynamic, much healthier from a you know, competitive standpoint for both the seller and the buyer. Um, and ultimately increase yield for everybody. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd basically mirror everything everything Ben said there. I think it's 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 critical that we start to push the the marketplace towards more of a unified auction approach. And these are these are patterns that we've seen, you know, as an exchange, for example, at Index, patterns that we've seen repeat in 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 web and mobile app and 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 in CTV as well of sort of things things start in a, in a waterfall manner things start in a like handshake in a martini lunch manner right and they move towards automation and interoperability and and i think ctv is going to follow the exact same path um and so you know we'll be able to deliver on the promise of a programmatic marketplace where buyers are able to access a rich array of supply and they won't have to sign you know individual contracts with every single supplier um, and, uh, and, and they'll be able to trust that they can approach that marketplace and meet their goals and meet their clients' goals um, in, in, in a safe way as we evolve the standards. So basically, I, I think it boils down to, we look at two, two aspects of creating a, a, a rich um, open marketplace for, for video content producers, right? There's transparency and security. And, and th those, are, those are both the things that I think are, are gonna, to some degree, start to break down some of the uh, some of the reliance on, on on deals in the current marketplace. Got it, Eric. Are, are there uh, any things on on the Synodyne networks? Uh, is there anything preventing you guys from from transacting on the open marketplace, or is what uh, Rob and Ben saying uh, ringing true with you in general? Yeah, I think. Look, I think um, the the we're we're actually you know we, we're actually pretty well optimized for for open market. Um, we, you know, I think, uh, we're newer to the space. Uh, so I think, um, uh, you know, early on we did have, uh, you know, we didn't, we were actually more reliant on the open market because, um, you know, buyers didn't, you know, we, we didn't have those relationships, uh, where people would be coming to us. So we would be, we be brokering those. We've actually are now, now that our brands have sort of been established, we're actually starting to get more people that are reaching out wanting to to you know as they've understand understanded our our brands and our position in the market and what we could offer we're actually now starting to go the other way which is kind of interesting um but um you know i do think you know we're, we're we actually look at that as an opportunity this year because you know there's there's actually there there have been actual limitations uh into just how far we could take uh the, the market just due to our new brands, um, you know, there's there's been a lot of technical challenges um, uh, in the fast market specifically that we're involved pretty heavily in, uh, and some other factors that have led to you know us having a lot of available inventory. So you know the 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 private marketplace deals have been uh, actually been a priority for us to actually uh, solve for some of the issues we have. So so in actuality, it's. It's we've actually been going the other direction, uh, but I think that's we'll go the other direction and then it'll actually go back the other direction, I think, is, is kind of what we're seeing happening here. Uh, from the buy side, Diana, is, is there any preference? I mean, I, I know that it sort of goes hand in hand with the, the trust side, right? I, I guess if, if you the buy side probably prefers to do PMPs because there's more trust involved because you're going directly to the publishers. Um, but let's assume that that uh, you know the the new standards get in place. There's high adoption, and and fraud isn't as much of a concern anymore. Uh, is there still this preference to to transact uh, via PMP? Are there other reasons why, or or do you think that uh, if these new mechanisms to to prevent fraud are in place, that uh, you'll see uh, transacting more on on open marketplace uh, uh, be the direction that the industry goes? Um, so from the policy's perspective, we do um, have, we approached um, the CTV and the, and the um, fragmentation of the, of the CTV space um, in different ways. We 
definitely um, have set up a, a specific sort of um, side of uh, internally to, to review those PMPs and, and perhaps transact directly with, with uh, publishers to ensure that um, fraud uh, rates are obviously negotiated beforehand and there is uh, ensure that transparency. Um, but we definitely, as I mentioned before, we are really uh, keen to, to collaborate with the industry to, to bring that transparency and that confidence to our clients as well. So we not only have that as in place, but we also review through the supply chain what other solutions are there to, to provide that sort of like confidence and, and, and to deliver all business outcomes to, to our clients and obviously work um, with a um, wider media plan as well, and how can we ultimately, you know, uh, provide the best results to, to our clients. So whilst uh, right now we do have that set up and, and we have um, the, the sort of private marketplace um, negotiation happening uh, across our markets, we are very, very keen and very open to continue to review uh, from the supply side, um, how can we actually implement those new te uh, tech specs and how can we better provide that um, sort of transparency? How do we work as well with the verification vendors to increase that transparency and bring it um, into, the, into the actual solutions that we have for the CTV marketplace? So I think there are a lot of things happening uh, for uh, the next 12 months, the next 24 months in, in the space. And we definitely want to keep an eye on, on how can we actually better uh, provide those solutions to, to our clients and our agencies across the, across the globe. Not, not, to, not to take us off on a tangent, perhaps, but I think one of the nice properties of the ads.cert spec that, that Ben uh, alluded to earlier is, is that it is very auditable by the third party ad verification vendors, right? And so if you have uh, you know, an SSAI, for example, in the position of sending impression notifications to all of the upstream parties, the ad verification vendor is included in that. And, and one of the things that they're able to do with that signed impression notification is to go through that authentication process and say, okay, this impression notification actually came from Publica, not someone who was attempting to spoof them and, uh, and, and again, that, that all goes towards building the trust um, in, in that it's not just something that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the buyer has to trust the publisher or the buyer has to trust the SSAI. If they can independently verify um, on, on some of these things. And as, a, you know, to, just as a, as a caveat though, right? What Ben said earlier is this does not solve every possible fraud vector, right? So this does um, address the, the vector of SSAI spoofing. And we have additional work to do under the ads.cert umbrella to address um, other uh, uh, aspects of securing the supply chain, uh, such as um, ensuring that no one tampers with the supply chain. So you know all the parties that touched a transaction, the publisher who originated it, the ad server that touched it, et cetera, um, and that no one can change that in flight. So that there's all sorts of additional um, safety security mechanisms, me mechanisms that we want to put in place, um, all to create that trust, um, as, as Diana was saying, um, for 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 our clients that that it's that it's safe for them to to buy in this in this space. Yeah, and, and really the the end place you want to get to is when you get a a billing notification when you get an impression pixel you want to know who fired it, um, from which application right which means is it is it uh, the Zumo app on Roku or is it on even you know on which device and what was the content right what was the actual video the stream being watched. We absolutely have the capabilities to surface that information. It's just about coordinating as an industry to, to be able to pass it in a, in a very secure way. Um, and, and I think once we get there, there's at least going to be that trust that for every dollar I spend, I know exactly where my ad ran. I, I can also know things like which ad ran before, which ad ran after. I mean, you can really get a lot of visibility into what happened, even at an aggregated level. Um, and then I think that the next level of that is Rob, what you're alluding to, which is in, in real time, then I can make my bid decisions based on, you know, what I see in the bid request. So it's not just post-delivery, but pre-delivery as well. Um, and, and, and I really think we can get there. We just need a little bit of coordination between all the parties involved. Are there other tools that you guys are using currently to, uh, to, to address fraud and trust and transparency? I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a swing at that one. Um, so so um, 
as, as, as much as we may put some of these technologies to use here, there, there's no replacement for good due diligence into the business practices of your partners, right? So, so we, we trust Publica and we've, we've, for example, we've done the due diligence to understand what uh, you know, uh, practices they put into place, business practices, security practices, et cetera. And, and we have to do that as an exchange. We have to do that with every supply partner, every supply path that we work through um, because that, you, know, you, you, can, you can have all this nice cryptographic signing, but if you're working with someone who has malicious intent, uh, like great, now they have signed a malicious um, you know, impression opportunity that didn't really help you. So, so um, I, I guess you know, it's, it's not a technology answer, but, but that's to say that for now, there is still no replacement for um, building trusted business relationships. And so um, if, if we can do that with a number of, of supply partners, and we also work with Synodyme, obviously, um, we are then able to offer, um, for example, things like curated platform deals in, in the absence of a richer open market, where we can say this is supply that like we have vetted, we have validated, we, we sort of put our stamp on. And over time, as we increase adoption of the various uh, you know, technologies and, and cryptographic signing techniques, et cetera, we can start to signal and, and offer those assurances to buyers as well. So it's sort of a multi-layered approach um, is, 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 is what we do. Got it. Eric, uh, can you expand a little bit on, on how Synodyme uh, addresses fraud? Are you guys looking to adapt ads.cert? Uh, are you, I'm assuming you probably uh, have adopted ads.txt, things like that. Are there other uh, mechanisms we, that you guys use? Yep, we have, uh, we have deployed ads.txt. We, we are uh, likely going to deploy ads.cert. Uh, a big thing as, as, you know, as Rob did mention um, is you know, you know, in, you know, in the, you know, in the business world, when we take on, you know, a vendor or uh, a client or, or anything, um, you know, we're doing an extensive business background check on them. And, uh, you know, we've really started to do uh, that same level of diligence. Um, but also, you know, it's both formal, um, you know, looking at, you know, doing, you know, doing credit checks, doing other things, um, looking at, you know, prior formation histories of businesses. A lot of times businesses form, uh, do nefarious things, shut down, and then those, those same actors go and restart. Uh, so we do extensive background checks on not only the current business they have, but other businesses that they were at previously and do background checks on those company names and instances. Um, you know, and what a lot of times we found is people have basically, you know, got caught, closed up shop and reestablished themselves as a new party. Um, but I think, you know, we're also getting to sort of the, the theoretical limits of the incremental value of adding new demand partners anyways. You know, we, we're managing quite a large amount of, of partners uh, in our current portfolio of partners. So it's to me, it's it's you know, it, it, somebody really has to be bringing something new and unique to the table, uh, be and on top of that, for us to even consider them, anyways. But I think this has done this has really helped us out. And obviously, the last piece is um, you know that's sort of the, you know some formal processes, then the informal processes where you know we we have great relationships with um, you know parties at the various platforms and. Um, you know, uh, DSPs, SSPs, and so on. We and we get and we we talk and we you know people, you know, there's lots of informal channels. I'm sure a lot of people are on uh, great Slack groups and you know, Reddit groups and other groups that people are on where you can get the real dirt uh, beyond what is publicly out there. And I think those kinds of networks are really important to be part of, not only for for vetting potential partners, but also you know, we're all in this together, right? And it's, um, there's a huge universe. There's, it's not a zero sum game of winners and losers. There's a way for everybody to win it with cooperation. So that's a little bit about our philosophy. Got it. So in general, it sounds like for, for uh, fraud and trust and transparency, there's a combination of, of you know, adopting the, the uh, standards that are out there and the technology that are out there today, but those don't quite meet the needs entirely. And so while those are being developed and while they evolve, the thing to do in the interim is to forge strong uh, business relationships and networks to, to have these conversations with your partners to make sure that, that your transactions are more secure and that you trust the folks that you are working with. 
Um, let's uh, switch gears just a little bit. I, I kind of I, I want to get some more uh, input from the buy side. I'm really curious, uh, Diana, how how the brands you you were representing are, are thinking about their CTV ad buys. Um, yeah, definitely. So um, from from the publicist perspective, we have been thinking on uh, activating across CTV buys for a few years now. Um, as we always uh, try to align our strategies with uh, what the audience are actually consuming. So our approach for any campaigns is always audience first. And um, across the AV landscape, um, there has definitely been an, a spike in CTV consumption as expected. Um, but that being said, a lot of the consumption was still taking place across uh, the publishers that we were already um, spending with across brand campaigns. So broadcasters and YouTube content has always been a big part of the audience's video consumption. And as a result, uh, for brands to scale, they have needed to really be part of their activation plans. So over the last few years, uh, we saw that audiences across these um, sort of um, bites consume more of their content via CTV than mobile or the desktop and the set top box. Um, but once we saw that this, um, uh, we started to look at all, what other sort of uh, partners were available to access um, that um, could add, actually add additional scale and um, into our AV campaigns. So we've seen a lot of new publishers uh, develop their offerings over the last two years in particular. Um, Roku, Pluto, as Ben mentioned, um, and our job is looking at their offering and making sure that they add value on top of uh, our AV buys and uh, drive that incremental reach as well and, and unique audience delivery. So as I mentioned before, we always look at the audience, what the audience is doing, and we are always audience focused. So if audiences continue to consume and grow their CTV consumption, then our plans will definitely uh, adjust uh, to ensure that, that we match that behavior. Got it. Uh, let's let's talk about uh, audience and, and addressability uh, for, for a minute then. So so I know, Ben, you touched on this in, in your presentation that, that CTV has a, a wide array of options for targeting. You've got contextual and then you have device IDs. I want to, I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, if you look at the rest of the, the digital ad industry, it's kind of going through an identity crisis right now in terms of addressability. How do you see that impacting uh, the CTV realm, which is, is sort of, there's all these different walled gardens right now, uh, uh, and it is very fragmented. Uh, is this something that, is there going to be a reckoning down the line where maybe there's more regulation that comes to pass? Or do you think that that, uh, that sort of conversation doesn't really uh, uh, expand into the CTV, CTV realm? Sure. So um, I, I personally think that um, the connected television is going to become the central piece of the household graph. And in some ways it already is. Um, First of all, because today it's a very well identified, you know, with identifiers um, environment where when you when you buy a TV, it's got a unique device ID, and that gets passed consistently, you know, in ad requests and things like that. So it allows a, a third party um, audience platform to take that ID, link it, be, have that become the central point point of the household, and then link it with other IDs that come from other devices. Um, the other really nice thing about TVs is you don't take them with you when you travel, right? They, they stay in your living room, which means IPs are consistent. And that's another really good reason why they're the center of the household graph. So um, as of right now, connected television is the best environment, I think, to run audience targeted campaigns and, and addressability is pretty much unbeatable. Um, now, where is that going to go? We could, you know, some people say, well, Potentially, you know, Roku's going to remove the device IDs. First of all, there's been no talks of that. So as of now, we don't, we shouldn't speculate. Um, but even if that happened, one thing to remember about connected TV is it's a very authenticated environment. Every, all of these streaming services, you pretty much have to sign into, right? So it's not, it's very different from the web because you have an identifier once you sign in. Um, and then it's about, you know, publishers coming together like through through something like the unified ID or, or you know the, the live ramp um, IDL or ramp ID um, you know to, to bring those uh, first party identifiers together into something that makes sense for everybody so I think connected TV has very 
bright days ahead from an addressability standpoint. And, and frankly, I think marketers are going to start to, to realize that it's, it's maybe one of the best environments to target audiences into. Any, I assume everyone agrees with that. Is there any, any dissenting opinions? No. Um, okay, I think we've got just a couple minutes left here. So let's dive into the questions from the audience. Uh, I've got one from uh, Ricky uh, Gutierrez. Uh, can you elaborate on what advanced ad potting means to you? Sure, so I think that that was uh, me. So that's basically the idea that when you're watching a, a a live stream or you know any type of content on on a connected television you the experience is the ad break right everybody's used to getting to break and then seeing multiple ads in a row um in in ad tech we call that an ad pod for some reason we gave it a different name uh but the idea is the same is replicating that same user experience that's what advanced ad potting is is delivering a tv ad break doesn't matter that it's delivered over the internet and so the things we can do today is um First of all, you know, maximize yield for the publisher. That's part. I mean, at least a publisher. That's our number one focus because we're we're sell side technology. Um, apply any business rules like creative deduplication, competitive separation, advertiser level separation, obviously block rules and things like that, um, so that you're creating an ad break that has differentiated ads from different industries that aren't going to frustrate the user. And then I think the, you know, the next level of that is not looking at advanced ad podding as a single ad pod, but ad pods within a session and say, well, if my algorithm works perfectly, but it gets me, you know, a 30 second Geico ad in first position at every single ad break for two hours, uh, you know, might be eight, 10 ad breaks. Um, that's not a good user experience either. So you have to have a, an, an overview at the session level to say, okay, um, maybe I don't want to deliver two insurance commercials within a time, a 10 minute time frame and things like that. So that's, that's what advanced ad potting means for us. And, and it's, you know, technology that we've been building for the past five years and, and continue to, to, to improve because it's, it's so crucial to, to this ecosystem. I think get, given that we're at, a, at an IAB event, I think we'd also be remiss not to mention the, the standard that Publica and Index and a bunch of other folks are also working on, which is to, to propose a way to handle advanced ad potting in OpenRTB 2.6. So right. there's uh, we're sort of currently going through a, a proposal process that would enable buyers and sellers to more effectively communicate about these things um, because OpenRTB 2.5 wasn't really designed with this use case um, in, in, in mind. Um, and I think one, one of the interesting dis, uh, decisions that we, that, that, that we have to make in, in, in the design is precisely been the thing you pointed at around, uh, do we want to be able to offer buyers um, uh, a description of individual pods or an entire playlist of pods so that they can make um, you know, smart ad buying decisions um, across an entire viewing session for a user? Um, and I, I personally land on the side that I think, I think it's really interesting to do that. And um, I think, uh, Diana, it'd be, it'd be interesting to know from your perspective, too, if, uh, if that's an interesting uh, proposition to be able to consider um, your, your, your uh, bidding approach across an entire session. It feels like that'd be something that the buy side would like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, I think uh, we always look at um, what the audience want. And I think um, having that, um, like enhancing that experience and having that um, ability to really work uh, with the uh, with the ad insertion and, and the ad sessions is definitely something that uh, we will looking forward to as well. And, and and with our clients as well, we know that they that's ultimately uh, what they want as well to deliver to their audiences. I would add one. I would add one thing. I think that is um, I think is uh, is really uh, really. Uh, compelling and critical on that same point is that the conception of when the break happens and how much advertising is shown at a break today is very much hard coded with metadata. Um, so it's a very sort of backwards thinking approach. To me, one of the main, one of the compelling innovations that I'm seeing some people play around with and develop is the ability to uh, decide dynamically when to show ads depending on user consumptive behavior co context, which I think uh, could lead to much better engagement and much better you know, retention um, 
uh, for advertise, you know, for advertising messages if it's deployed correctly. So I think that's you know talking about next generation stuff around ad breaks is I find it very compelling. That's a great point. Awesome. All right, I think we are actually at time now. So I want to thank you all of the the panelists again for for a really great uh, conversation.